Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, this week's uh, speaker series, our Boardroom Insight speaker series. Uh, there are a couple of things that I want to make sure we have before we, well, OK. If that advances. There. Please make sure that if you've got cell phones or any other electronic devices, iPods, whatever, that you turn them off. Uh, our presentation uh, uh, this morning is going to be from Mr. Greg Steinhaffel, the CEO of Target. I'll say more about him in just a minute. You should have all, if you're registered for either the graduate or undergraduate Boardroom Insights section, you should have received a card. Uh, please make sure you fill that out and hand it in at the end. Uh, and for information, our next presentation will be October the 2nd. Uh, Daniel Jordan, who's the former CEO, uh, or joint, excuse me, who's the former CEO of Walgreens, uh, will be talking. But this morning, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Greg Steinhoffel, who is the CEO uh, of, uh, of Target Corporation. Uh, Mr. Steinhoffel joined Target in 1979, served as the executive vice president uh, for merchandising for a period in the, in the 1990s. Uh, he was uh, named president of Target Stores in 1999 and CEO of Target Corporation in 2007. Uh, he has also been director of Toro Company uh, for about the last 10 years and serves as a member of the board of the Retail Industry Leaders Association. Uh, Mr. Steinhoffel is a graduate of Carroll College and a graduate of the Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. I don't want to take any more of his time. Please join me in welcoming Greg Steinhoffel. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today on campus. Looks like we're going to have a beautiful weekend and uh, hopefully a, a great outcome for the football game tomorrow. Uh, I have a couple of uh, strategic topics that I would like to uh, talk about today as part of this discussion. And then uh, uh, and these are topics that are, that are uh, relevant to, to Target, they're relevant to uh, all businesses, and they're relevant to you as potential business people or leaders of, uh, of uh, any other uh, type of endeavor that, uh, uh, that you may uh, pursue. Um, I'm also going to share some uh, leadership tips that I've learned over the, over the uh, past 30 years of my career, and then I'll close with... Uh, about a 20-minute Q&A. So I've got about an hour's worth of material or, or, or thereabout, and I'll leave plenty of time for Q&A at, at the end. So these three strategic topics that I'd like to uh, talk about today, the first one um, is one that's uh, really relevant to Target, and that is, is it possible to compete with the world's largest and most powerful company and win? Because we find ourselves in an unenviable position of having to compete against Walmart who has a uh, $400 billion scale behind it. And while we're a Fortune 30 company and we're very you know, large by relative standards, when you're competing in some enterprise that big, it is, it is, uh, it's a daunting task because of their power, their scope, their scale, their pricing advantage, and their ability to really put you out of business if you don't, uh, if you don't really have your, uh, your, your act together as, a, as an organization. So while you, while you think about that, you think about the answer to that, uh, let me first give you a little background so I can level set everybody as it relates to uh, who we are before I answer the question about how we, you know, how we, going about, how we go about doing that. First of all, we're the fifth largest retail in corporate America with annual revenues around $65 billion. We've had a, a, a strong history of corporate performance. We earn about uh, four plus billion dollars in EBITDA a year. Uh, as I said, we're a Fortune 30 company. Um, we have a very broad corporate enterprise. What most of you see is the culmination of an incredible amount of effort and energy that's put forth through uh, a whole host of, of individuals that, uh, that comprise Target Corporation. Uh, we have 350,000 team members that, uh, that are part of Target, and we are an entire and complete ecosystem from a business standpoint. So we have one of the largest property development and real estate and construction companies in the world. We have you know, huge teams focused on uh, human resources and benefits and organizational effectiveness, uh, marketing, stores organization, IT, legal and asset protection, 
merchandising. Uh, we, we cover the gamut as it relates to whatever career opportunities there uh, could possibly exist. Our corporate headquarters are in Minneapolis, and we have approximately 11,000 team members that comprise our corporate headquarters. And Minneapolis is really the central nervous system of the company, and that's where the key decisions are made before they're pushed out to, uh, to our store's organization. And, the, and, the, and as I'll get into later, it's really the integration of all of these unique parts and pieces that come together that makes our, our business model and our proposition uh, so, so unique. And while we are a domestic store only, we have uh, a global footprint because we source products from all over the globe. We have our own sourcing organization uh, in about 25 countries, and we have a, a huge sourcing um, and uh, IT business and business analytics function in uh, Bangalore, India as well. So we're a very large and integrated uh, enterprise. Um, we have a very unique set of businesses that come together in our, in our store. And we're unique because of the blend of what is in a Target store. No other store in America really has that unique mix. We are about 20% apparel, 20% of our sales are in apparel, about 20% of our sales are in home-related products from housewares to domestics, about 30% of our sales are in assorted hard lines, toys, sporting goods, electronics, uh, kinds of categories, music and books, and then we have approximately 15% of our business in food and 15% of our business in other kinds of uh, commodity-oriented products like uh, health and beauty and uh, pharmacy, uh, both OTC, R RX, and, uh, and uh, wellness products. So uh, unlike our primary competitor, Walmart, who is very, very dominant in food, we grew up as a general merchandise retailer, and now we're starting to strengthen our, our footprint in, in uh, food. Walmart, by today's standard, is the largest food uh, retailer in America, and to a lesser extent, they focus on uh, general merchandise. So. Our mix, the way it is balanced, is somewhat unique. And ultimately, as we continue to grow, we're going to be looking for virtually a 20% mix across the board, 20, 20, 20, 20, so that we have both the non-discretionary uh, kinds of businesses like health and beauty and paper goods and food that are uh, need-based businesses. And we're going to also have um, a, a nice mix of discretionary. And we think it's the, the unique combination of discretionary and non-discretionary that makes our, our business model uh, uh, so unique. We focus a lot on the guest. We're really deep into research and making sure that we really understand how to solve problems and how to provide solutions, how to be the best content editors in the country so when you come into our stores you find an experience that's easy and simple and you can find virtually everything you want. Uh, we really want to be the preferred shopping destination for the demographics that we serve. We don't want to be all things to everybody, but in that demographic profile, which is essentially family of four making $60,000 a year, we want to be their preferred shopping destination. And I can tell you, we sweat every little detail you can possibly think of so that that ultimate experience that, uh, that you, uh, that you uh, uh, see and, and encounter when you're in our stores uh, makes sense. Lastly, we spend uh, billions of dollars on building our brand and our franchise, and it's been one of our keys to success, and that is we've been able to successfully differentiate ourselves from, uh, from our, com our primary competitor, and I'll talk more about that in a second. There are 14 other four, uh, benchmark companies that we obsess about. Uh, clearly, in America, there are, there's almost a million retail competitors, but these are the 14 that mean the most to us. So basically, we compete against Kmart and Sears and Walmart across the enterprise, and then we look to the best in class in each of the slices of business that we compete in. So in, a, so in the apparel business, we're going to focus on companies like, like Macy's and some specialty-based apparel companies like, uh, like Kohl's and JCPenney's. In our convenience businesses, we're going to focus on CVS and Walgreens. And, uh, and as we go down the various uh, segments, Best Buy and Electronics, Toys R Us in uh, uh, in toys, we know that we have to be both competitive versus Walmart, and we have to be respectfully com competitive versus all of these big box competitors. So everything we do, all of our, all of our, uh, all of our benchmarking, all of our pay practices, everything is uh, benchmarked against these uh, these uh, fourteen com uh, companies. So. Uh, obviously, the answer to the topic number one is yes, we, we believed we can compete with the world's greatest company and win because I think that, that we've demonstrated uh, by our success that uh, if you develop the right strategy and operational uh, disciplines and execution, you can, uh, you can do it. So how have we done it? There, 
There was a point in time about 18 years ago, back in the early 1990s, where it was one of those near-death experiences that I think most enterprises have, where there's a big fork in the road, and you've got to make that choice. Do I go to the right? Do I go to the left? And, and, uh, and what are the implications of that? And that was where Walmart was gaining incredible momentum, and they were just, just basically wiping out everybody. And we had to decide, are we going to compete with them? And, and if we are, how are we going to compete with them, or do we need to develop a, a new strategy? Because at, back in the 90s, virtually Kmart, Walmart, and Target were essentially had the same business models. And it was at that point in time, we made two strategic decisions. One was we will price all of the identical items exactly with Walmart, and we are not going to have any prices higher in our store except for a couple of pennies, nickels, or dimes. And the second decision that we made was that we were going to differentiate ourselves from them, and we were going to recreate ourselves and take a decade trying to build this, this Target franchise, and a franchise that is more upscale and that redefines the, the battlefield and the playing field. And so where Kmart and Walmart ultimately ended up fighting one another for the same demographics with Walmart. Walmart winning that battle, we knew that if we didn't tack differently, we wouldn't be around. And, and we knew that it was going to take a long time to reframe our business model and to, and to develop into something that we weren't at that time. And it has taken 15 years for us to really break, break through that clutter and develop this differentiated strategy. But today we have that. And today the perception is that Target is a different company. And so we've been able to reposition us into higher demographics that match much more closely to those of a Kohl's and a Costco. So we pull consumers and guests and people that shop in Nordstrom's and Neiman Marcus all the way down to those that uh, earn $50,000 a year in, in cross shops. Because we've spent more money in our stores and on our aspirational experience, we've been able to attract demographics that still want to have great value and style and design, but they don't want to spend more for it. And it's been, uh, it's been a long journey for it. And, uh, and the, elevator, the elevator version of what that means is uh, this tagline on, on, the, on the screen that says, expect more, pay less. That's really what it all boils down to. We're gonna, we're, we want you to expect more, and you're going to get a lot more, and you're going to pay less uh, in our stores. All great enterprises have to have vision, missions, values, and strategic priorities to focus on, because if you don't, you don't have a roadmap in terms of how to get there. So I'll come back to the vision shortly. But our, like I said earlier, our, our mission is to be the preferred sh uh, shopping destination, focusing on uh, delivering uh, outstanding value, continuous uh, innovation, and a superior uh, experience in store. Our corporate values have been fairly rock solid for the last decade or two. And unless your values are firmly in place, you're going to drift apart because, because, uh, because the glue of the organization aren't going to value the same thing. So, so these are our five corporate values that we adhere very, very uh, strictly to. Uh, be fast, fun, and friendly. We just celebrated our 20th year of, of wanting to have a culture that's, that is just highly energetic, very fast, having fun all the time, and being friendly, particularly to, uh, to, the, to the consumers that uh, shop our stores. We call them guests not shoppers, because we want to uh, engage our team so that they, they treat our, uh, our, uh, our shoppers more aspirationally. So we've been using the word guest for 20 years, uh, 20 years now. So we focus on that kind of experience. We focus on diversity and an inclusive uh, uh, culture. Uh, if Target does nothing else, we are a leadership, we are a leadership machine. We build leaders. You come to Target, you work for Target, we will build you, we will teach you uh, how to be a great leader. That's one of the things that I'm most proud of this organization is we really take and we look for great raw material in terms of uh, uh, new hires and we build them and we sh help shape them and, and, uh, and teach them how to be great leaders. Um, reputation management, particularly in, in this time and, and day and age, uh, you can work a lifetime to build your corporate reputation and it can be damaged and, or, and, uh, and diminished uh, in a moment's notice by, uh, by things that you do or things that you either do intentionally or unintentionally. And we have a whole strategic framework around making sure that we are focused on, uh, on reputation uh, management. Uh, in advancing our uh, reputation. And then lastly is speed is life. We're in a business that moves at Mach 3 all the time. We cannot get slowed down and over analysis. We can't get paralyzed by analysis. We can't, we can't um, focus too much energy on, on, uh, on spending a lot of time debating every little decision. 
we are in the consumer business and they move very fast and we have to move very fast and large enterprises typically become slow and bureaucratic and we we are very maniacal about making sure that we are quick decision makers. We get together, we make those decisions, we take risks, and we move forward. And we'd rather make a decision and make a mistake than, uh, than go slow and try and do everything perfect. And for us to be relevant in today's marketplace, we've got to be right on with our consumers, and we have to take risks, and we have to t anticipate where they're going to be, not where they've been in the marketplace. And that means you've got to operate with speed. So those are our corporate values. To keep us all on the same page, you've got to have a strategic framework in terms of what's important. Strategy is not only what you do, it's what you don't do. So one of the ways we, or we align our organization is, is we have distilled all of the initiatives that we focus on into six key strategic initiatives, and if, and if you're doing or working on some other project that doesn't line up under one of these six, we don't want you to do it. So whether it's our stores organization, or it's our IT, or organizational effectiveness, everything we do has to fall into one of these six strategic initiatives, from driving growth, profitability, managing expense, productivity and capital, delivering a superior guest experience in our stores, uh, being effective from an organizational standpoint, and, uh, and advancing our reputation. I always like to tell groups when they say, you know, tell me about, you know, how does this target really, you know, uh, tick and, and what's, what are the key ingredients? I will tell you the two more, most important levels and people in, in our company are two. One is the senior buyer based in Minneapolis. They are the owner entrepreneur of each and every business. If you dissect a target store into a hundred different businesses, each run, one is run, run by a senior buyer and then a, a team of around, uh, around them and they are the content and they are the marketing and merchandising innovators. The other key individual is that person that runs our stores. Our store team leaders are, are the people that have to execute the strategy and engage the guest in making sure that the, that the back end of our brand promise is consistent. Everything we do is focused on supporting these two platforms within our company. On the Minneapolis Bay side, uh, all those little dots are things like marketing, strategy, store operation, presentation, supply chain, sourcing, vendors. All of all the activities that we do, we put together to make sure that we're, we're allowing our entrepreneurs to be the best merchants in the company. So we've got this very elaborate matrix in terms of how to interact from design development, but we want to make our senior buyers really the stars in the show. Same thing on the store side of the business too. We've got all these other functions that have one mission in life and that's to support our organization. And it's the balance and it's, it's, it's the way these two groups coexist together is what really is the secret sauce of Target because there's so many decisions, so much complexity and we, and we know that if we can make sure that the epicenter of everything we do organizationally focuses on these two groups, we're going to have a, a far better uh, output. So with 350,000 people and multiple strategies and values, you may ask, you know, how do you keep everybody on the same page? And it's probably one of the most toughest, uh, toughest things that I have to do and our teams have to do is, and, and that's get uh, organizational alignment and, and making sure that everybody is, is uh, uh, you know, is passionate, is, uh, is really super committed, are highly energized and feeling valued and appreciated. Um, it's, it's no different than, uh, than what uh, you all do as uh, students and faculty in terms of the pep rallies and the things that you do to bring the, the teams together on campus. And I know there's a big pep rally tonight for tomorrow's game and everybody gets together and, and you, you, know, you, uh, you, you, know, you get all riled up and you try and get everybody on the same page. Well, we like to do the same thing and we try and bring all of our teams together in various different ways. And I, I thought I'd show you how we, uh, how we uh, uh, do it. Once a year we have a big national meeting. I've got a three minute video clip that uh, gives you a sense of how we bring in our stores teams. We bring in uh, not only our, our store team leaders, but the key people that uh, surround them in the field. And all of our key people uh, globally come to Minneapolis. We just had our national meeting. We had 11,000 people dressed in red and khaki, our signature uniform, in the Target Center. And we spent uh, four and a half hours with, uh, with presentations in terms of what we're doing from a strategic standpoint, what are our op operational uh, objectives, what our thoughts are on the holiday. We talked about, uh, uh, we had enterprise-wide recognition events that recognized great performance. We added a fun factor because we bring in entertainers to, to uh, liven up the crowd and, uh, and uh, bring a little extra fun and excitement. And these are people that do it for us for free because of our associations with them. 
So without further ado, I will, uh, I'll give you a three-minute video clip of, uh, of our version of, of Notre Dame's pep rally. How am I doing on time? seemed like a revival, it was. I mean, it, we, had, we had a great time. Uh, that Frugalista um, um, fashion show, all of that merchandise was Target merchandise. All of those models were all Target team members. And we had like two or 300 people uh, that participated. So it was, it was a great event. And that's, that's really, uh, we, we try and hold those events twice a year. Uh, the fall is the biggest one. We do a smaller version of that in the spring just to make sure that we are investing in our team and we're all getting together and we're really focused on how do we keep the organization together? How do we, uh, how do we drive alignment in the organization so everybody understands what they do, why they do it, and how it fits to the, to the whole? And if you, can, if you can do that with your organization, you can get everybody, regardless of what they do, whether they're unloading a truck or they're working in a, uh, in a sourcing office in uh, Shanghai or they're in one of our uh, financial service credit facilities or they're in a distribution center or they're in headquarters, everybody feels a sense of purpose and, and they feel a sense of pride and they, they work that much harder to, to try and make uh, target a uh, uh, success. So, that was question number one. Can you compete with the world's greatest company and win? Um, I, I would say yes in a heartbeat. I would also always use this caution, and that is I think complacency is one of the, one of the um, most uh, dangerous kinds of um, uh, things that can set into any organization. So with success breeds complacency, and, and one of the things that, uh, that we've got to continue to focus on is not being complacent. Now, this kind of economic environment has, has wiped out any, anybody's complacency, but there were a number of years when the economy was great and our organization was feeling terrific, and we were maybe a little bit more resistant to change than we are today, and that's, that has a tem tendency to seep into the organization, and that's one of the things that we as a senior team talk about a lot, making sure we're continuously driving forward and re-innovating and re-challenging the status quo to make sure that we are uh, always moving forward uh, as an organization. The second uh, uh, key strategic topic that I'd like to talk about today is what expectations, if any, should we have of today's corporations? I mean, there is a lot that is said about today's corporations. 
And, uh, and there are a lot of great examples of, of corporations that do great work, and there are some that, uh, that uh, uh, have not only bad reputations and bad pay practices and have, have not regulated their risk and, and have put the, you know, their enterprises at risk, um, gone bankrupt, they've put the, you know, the country at risk. So should, there be any, should we have expectations as, uh, uh, as individuals of today's corporations? I would tell you from the target perspective, it's a, it's a resounding you know, yes, because we were, we were founded in a way that, uh, um, that put corporate values and uh, multiple constituencies right at the center of who we are as an organization. Our vision as a company is to balance the, the balance the four key constituency: our, our guests or our shoppers, our team, our shareholders, and communities. Those are the four key groups that we focus our vision around. And we have a very aspirational vision. And some people even say it could be a tad arrogant. And we, our vision, is to be not the biggest, but the best company, to be the best company ever for our guests team shareholder, shareholders and community. So we for, focus uh, a lot of energy in making sure that we're trying to find the right balance. You know, if you just focus on your shareholder and it's all about the bottom line, it means you're not taking care of your team. And it means you're not investing in your communities or you're not taking care of your guests. If you only focus on your, on your shoppers, you're probably not generating enough shareholder value and that's gonna limit your growth. So there's a lot of trade-offs and balancing that has to go on when you've got a vision like this. But we think this is the right uh, vision for, for us and it has served us well. We were born in 1902. We were the first corporation in America to commit 5% of their earnings, their pre-tax earnings to charitable causes, and that was in 1946. So for 63 years, we have been giving back 5% of our profits to the communities uh, that we do business uh, in. That is over a billion dollars cumulatively from, from that day. And today, with our profit structure the way it is, it's uh, somewhere in the $170 million a year, which is over $3 million a week. So uh, it's a lot of money that we reinvest uh, back into our, our communities. We're primarily focused on education, but we support a variety of of other initiatives from, uh, from the arts, uh, social services, and where our team members like to volunteer. Target was born in 1992. We went public as Dayton Hudson Corporation in 1967. I talked about our differentiated strategy and that seminal moment in, in 1991 where we decided to take a different fork in the road. Uh, we had a, a corporation name change in the year 2000. That's when Dayton Hudson yielded to Target because Target became the biggest part of the corporation and it was only logical to change the name from Dayton Hudson to Target. We, uh, since th that time in 2004, we divested ourselves of uh, both our Marshall Fields and uh, Mervyn's um, specialty apparel division. And then lastly, uh, 2009 was a, was a, spring of 2009 was a pretty challenging time for Target because it was the first time that, that we were challenged by an outside shareholder in terms of uh, not only the, the strategy of the company, but really uh, at our core values. And, and uh, it was one of the most visible proxy contests that uh, um, has been undertaken in corporate America. And it was really that litmus test to say, hey, are we really a good corporation or not? Is this vision stuff, does this really matter to our shareholder base? Or is this just fluff? So when we were under attack um, during this proxy contest and we were out telling our side of the story, ultimately we prevailed 80-20 over the shareholder activist. And we prevailed because it did matter. Our CFO and myself met with our top 50 shareholders in a six week period of time. And we went for all parts of the United States and even outside the United States. And we sat down across the table and we really you know, had that open and direct dialogue as it relates to what do they value and what is our vision and, and do they really believe that we are the right kind of corporation that delivers the right kind of results, that treats our team well, that invests in our, in our community and, and really live by good, strong corporate values and, uh, and, are, and are a great corporation because if we weren't and if ultimately we thought we were and the marketplace didn't, 
that vote would have gone the other way, and, and it really validated that that uh, a corporation like Target that really focuses on a broad mission is accepted and is important to large shareholder groups. And they appreciated the fact that we do have a strategy and a vision that is focused on a broad set of con uh, constituencies. So we were very pleased that we won that contest and we won it handily. Um, but it was a really, really good reminder that uh, that to be successful in corporate America, you've got to have really, really high standards, and you've really got to invest in uh, in your communities and in your team, and uh, and operate your enterprise with uh, with high levels of in, in integrity. So, uh, the answer to that question number two is obviously you've got to have very high expectations, and I think everybody in this room should have high expectations of uh, of corporations. The third strategic uh, topic today is. Should business leaders or do business leaders have an obligation to prepare the next generation of, of, uh, of business leaders or leaders in general? And obviously part of the reason why I'm here is because I believe strongly that we do have an obligation to share the journey, to talk about things that work and don't work and, and make sure that we, uh, that we take the time to mentor and, and coach and, and, uh, and, uh, and share what we, what we have uh, so that uh, the next generation is, is even better equipped than uh, my generation uh, of leaders were. So uh, I'd like to spend a little time just talking about uh, you know, things that, uh, that I've learned along the way and, and things that I think are uh, uh, you know, helpful. It's not an, an, an all-encompassing list, and it's not you know, in you know, top to bottom priority order, but uh, over my 30 years as a leader at Target, uh, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've learned a lot. I've, I've done a lot of good things and, 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 uh, and a lot of errors. And, and, uh, and, and so I thought that uh, you know, I would take you through some of the things that are, that are important. I always start with talent. When, when, when people ask me, geez, Greg, how do you spend your time? You know, you're a CEO, big company. You've got you know, soup to nuts, you know, global footprint, merchandising, marketing. How can you possibly get it all done? And I always start at the same place. And it always starts with the talent on your team. Because if you have the right talent on your team, you can win and you can accomplish so much more than if you don't have the right talent on your team. So this is really a, a two-part part thing. One is, one is we want to develop leaders, like I said. And so we have a very robust program, a part of our leadership expectations. And that starts with, there's four key areas. One is, it starts with you, the person. Because if you're not built from the core, you can't deliver great results if your core isn't strong. right? So, so we start with a whole leadership program that makes sure that you are grounded in the right place and you have the right set of core values. And then, almost like a concentric circle, you can go outward for that. So once you really have your values intact, and you are right, and you're aligned, and you're really focused on, on uh, making sure you're the, you're the right kind of leader with the right kind of values, then you start to spread. And, and the, next, the next area would be team. So when you get your personal act together, then you have to be terrific with your team. And you have to develop your team. And you have to invest a lot of time and, and energy and in collaborate and making sure that you're growing and teaching and training those people that work with you day in and day out and people that, that work in other disciplines. And so the second area we focus on is really team. Third is thought leadership. I was saying uh, earlier to Doug, uh, he was asking me, uh, you know, what kind of people you like to hire at Target? And the, and the natural, uh, I think the natural answer is, well, we, we like business people. And, uh, and that's really not the case. We want, uh, and we are looking for bright, enthusiastic, ambitious, team-oriented individuals that want to pursue excellence. And we really don't care what your discipline is. Our prior chief information officer, a technology leader, had a, was a music major in college. We have people in key position that had combinations of English and philosophy degrees. Now, our, the, the team that runs finance, they're pretty steeped in, in finance and in, in analytics. But people that are in marketing or merchandising or in HR or in cer certain parts of property development or stores, we're looking for just great people that are ambitious and that always look at their educational journey 
or, or life as a journey of continuous in, uh, education. And so we just want people that, that care, that are ambitious, that are smart, and are willing to learn because we can teach you the details about the business, but we can't, we can't it's, it's hard to inspire someone if they don't have the spark and the energy to do that. So we're looking for great thought leaders primarily, and we want to take those thought leaders and put them all together as, as, as part of our, uh, as part of our uh, a sauce at Target. And then lastly, we want leaders that do all of that and deliver great results. Because ultimately, we are a performance-based organization. It is about driving performance and results. You can be good, you can be teamy, you can be lovable, you can invest in your community, you can volunteer, you can take care of your guests and, and your team, but ultimately, you've got to drive results. Because results matter. And we have a whole system internally where we are fanatical about having the right kind of objective metrics. So you, regardless of where you are in your career at Target, you know where you stand and we know where you stand because we try and develop sets of metrics that really help describe and allow you to perform. So in our highly structured areas like merchandising, you've got you know, very obvious metrics like sales and markdowns and uh, inventory management and gross margin and, and, uh, and things that are, are really, really uh, easy to determine. But we try, and, we try and push those metrics all throughout our organization so that individuals can, can know how they are performing versus the right set of benchmarks. And by doing that, we've become a meritocracy. We promote people that perform. We promote people that have great potentials, that are great leaders, and have great performance records. And that's very important to us. So we like to think of ourselves, when somebody says, Greg, tell me the difference between you and Walmart from a team standpoint, I would tell you this. They are a productivity culture. We are a developmental culture. They focus on primarily results, and we focus on both what you do and how you do it. And we, we marry those two together. So those combination of leadership traits are really important to us. And so we really focus on the individual as part of talent development. So back to the first part of the question, I always focus on my, my number one focus is on our team and, and talent development and what we're doing to grow our current and next and our future generation of leaders. That's why we're here on campus and part of the recruiting efforts. We want the best and the brightest and bring them into our organization. And then it's about, it's really about the talent development and it's the integration and it's the teamwork that you bring within your, in your organization. So I always say, every time you're with anybody, you're either, you're either being a mentor, a coach, you're challenging, or you're assessing. You're never just there. And I tr we try and live our life in, in that kind of mode where it's always one of those kinds of things because if we focus on talent development and each one of our teams and we grow our teams to be better and more capable, they are just going to perform and they're going to enjoy the, they're going to enjoy it a lot more. So I spend about a, a third of my time related to talent. So that is the primary objective, I think, of, of great organizations, great leaders, and, 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 I, and I have to model that be, uh, behavior, and I spend a lot of time on, on talent. I think it's the most important things that any great enterprise uh, can focus on. And if they tell you it's strategy or it's execution, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if you don't have the right team in place to get it done. Because, you, because eventually people leave the organization. And if you don't have the culture that continuously breeds great leaders, eventually it is a, not a sustainable strategy. And there's so many companies in America that are great for a period of time. And they're on the top of the heap, whether it's Kmart or Montgomery Wards. I could list, I could list 20 companies in my last 30 years that at some point in time were very revered and respected for great things, and now they don't exist today. And it's because they didn't have a sustainable strategy, and sustainable strategy comes with a sustainable commitment to developing your team. So uh, if I sound passionate about the team aspect, I am, because it is, it is going to be the difference between this organization being a greater organization 10 years from now, or uh, some kind of a footnote in a history book or somebody is going to write a case study about the demise of Target, right, someday. I mean, there's great stories about the rise of Target, but I don't want to see a, ever a story about the demise of Target. And I think the number one way to, to um, 
not allow that demise to happen is to really focus on talent because that can be a sustainable strategic advantage. So I would tell you, all of you here today, focus on, on talent, focus on your stuff, on, uh, on yourself. I'm also going to come back to that a little, a little later. Second message is really to think big, boldly, and broadly. Now, we're in a Catholic institution. You might think it's the kind of the sign of the cross, but it's really not. This is my way of really quickly framing up um, what I think is important uh, for you as you develop in, into leaders um, throughout your career. And I would, I would say it really simply, when, when you come out of college, Generally, you're, looking, you're, you're hired because of your technical aptitude. You've got a skill. People want to plug you into the organization. You haven't developed strategic skills yet, and so you have to be an, you have to be an expert, and you're in pretty much an executional role, and that's really the bottom part of that, of that, uh, uh, of, of that cross. On the top is what you develop when you've been there 30 years like I have been. I, don't, I appreciate the the executional detail, but I'm focused on a very much higher strategic level. So throughout careers, you've got, you start very technical, but eventually you've got to continuously push yourself to become broader and bigger and more capable of seeing the world instead of a small little prism. You've got to see the world this big. And it's a really a hard transition for people that become subject matter experts to really then get broad and steeped. I have a general business background. I don't have a finance background. I don't have a, an accounting degree. You know, I don't have, I'm not a psych, I'm not a, I don't have a PhD in psychology. You know, I don't have, I, I, I don't have the experience in these disciplines, but yet, yet as, as, a, as a leader of a large enterprise, your scope has to be very, very broad. I have to know enough about technology and, and other disciplines. So I've had to take my scope from being a trainee one day into a very large global thinker, understander, uh, making sure that uh, I'm engaged in thoughtful debate at the national level, focused on our reputation, our strategy, what's next for the company and the enterprise. And so it's a real, it's a, it's a real, um, uh, it's really important that as you go through your careers, you focus on opportunities and you find ways to broaden your scope along the way if you aspire to be someone that's in a, a position of general management. Then the right and the left is uh, no more complicated than making sure that you are finding ways to tap into the creativity that all of you have and the analytics and the analysis that all of you have. So you've got a right brain and you've got a left brain that over time it's important that you develop both sides of it. Because if you just focus on the analytics and on the left side of it, I can tell you one of my you know, biggest frustrations with our finance department and, and teams and interns and people that do analysis is they're always looking behind. They're always looking at the, what happened in the past. And they're always analyzing data that happened yesterday, but they're not really good at projecting. And, 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 and as the old Wayne Gretzky say, saying is, they're not looking at where the puck is going. They're only focused on where the puck is and where it's been. Where it's been. And so they're not really good at, at, at thinking creatively and, and strategically. So you know, I'm challenging that group. You've got to think differently. You've got to have those technical skills, but you just can't look in the rearview mirror. You can't run a company looking doing what you do tomorrow based on what you're looking at yesterday. You've got to take risks and you really got to think differently about that. Same holds through on the creative side. We are a huge creative machine. I mean, we are a big marketing. I mean, that's what we do. We're a marketing machine and we're a branding machine and we're a merchandising machine and that means we have to be creative and innovative and we have to think big about taking risks and buying products and, and developing store formats even before we know they're going to work. So there's a huge creative element, but you've got to have discipline with that creative thinking through. So we've got to educate our creative types to make sure that they understand. And whether they possess it themselves or not is less important to whether or not they appreciate that that's got to be part of the mix and part of that cross-functional team that they're on has to pull in those individuals that have those other skills that they don't. The, the best, most robust teams are the ones that have all of these kind of skills covered so that you, we've, we've got the full gambit covered. So I say you got it. You have to think big, think boldly, think, uh, think broadly. Third is take risks. 
if you take the safe journey and the safe path, uh, it, it, will, it will get you there and maybe slow and steady take, uh, wins the race. But I think that, that you can accelerate your career and you can, uh, you can really uh, grow and develop much faster if you take risks that otherwise are outside of your, your comfort zone or your wheelhouse or your skill set. In my career, there were, there were times where I can't tell, I was so scared about taking that next assignment. It was so different from what I knew that it was just, I can't believe I'm going to go do this or should go do this. And only in hindsight is it 2020 where it says, wow, am I, am I glad today that I did that? There was a time when I was running our electronics division and I was asked to run our supply chain. I had no supply chain experience. I went from running our supply chain, which is boxes through distribution centers and its cartons and its productivity and its analytics, to running all of the apparel and accessories business at Target, the highest, most fashion, most high risk area in, in the company. These are assignments where my wife would tell you, I mean, I didn't sleep. I was, I was just beside myself. And, uh, and, and, but ultimately, they, they were the richest experiences that I had. They were the experiences that, that taught me more about different parts of the company and organization. So when you get in those positions in your career and you're wondering, should I do that? Should I take that assignment, whether it's overseas or a different part? I would encourage you to go for it. I really do. I think that the... I think that the uh, that the leverage you gain by taking those kind of risks are generally uh, more than offset uh, what you might think is going to be the downsides. And you'll probably surprise yourself in terms of what you're able to accomplish by taking those uh, stretch kinds of uh, assignments. Appreciate the tough times. You know, when, when the wind's at your back and you're going downriver and you're, you're, you're with the current, everybody thinks they're better than they are. Your performance is better, and you all think it's attributable to you, know, to you. and you think that your business model is better, and, and uh, life is good. And so the tendency is to kind of back off a little bit, and, uh, and, and you don't push quite as hard because the results kind of come easy. It is only when you get into some tough times, like we are in today, where the rubber really meets the road and where you really have an opportunity to really reassess because all of the flaws become exposed and all of the lack of innovation and all of the things that you thought you did well, you may not do as well. And so when you are in environments like this and you have to reassess everything you do, this is the time to really appreciate where you're at and what you're doing because it will teach you, and I have learned far more from the mistakes that I have made in my career than I have when the successes happen. So whether it's this environment, or post 9-11, or recessions that we've had in 1991 or 1992, or where we've had other big difficulties as an organization when we didn't know who we wanted to be in 1991 and we're sitting there thinking, we can't possibly make any money if we are going to price against Walmart. That's impossible. Well, the scale, the organization, so you can't, we can't do that. And ultimately, we took the biggest markdown in our history, and we said, if we don't do that, we're, you know, we're gonna, we're, we may not be around in 10 years. So we had to, we had to you know, appreciate when you get into these really difficult climates that uh, really challenge your business model. We are a trend organization, so we are, we are focused on uh, this curve, which is the, uh, a very prominent curve that is in our marketing and merchandising areas. And every product that we sell, we have 80,000 items in our store day in and day out. And throughout the course of the year, we probably go through about 250,000 items. Virtually every item that comes in our store lives on a life cycle. And it's important we know where it is on the life cycle. Because if you know where it is, you know how to take advantage of it. You know how much to buy. You know where the sweet spots are and where to make money. You know when you have the greatest volume and then when items become, uh, become commodities. And ultimately, you got to get rid of them because uh, you either don't make enough money or the consumer doesn't want them uh, anymore. Like my comment about product life cycles um, or, or uh, de personal development, I like to think about lots of things as it relates to this life cycle. I think that it is highly ap applicable to the merchandise we sell, 
I think it's highly applicable to the marketing campaigns that we run. There's got to be an end life and a shelf life to all of our campaigns. Otherwise, we're not going to be developing new, fresh ideas. I think it's very relevant to process management so that you're constantly inno innovating all of the processes and the technology and the, and the business intelligence behind your organization. And most importantly, all of you are a trend curve. You come into an organization, you go through the test, and guess what? You're incoming. And as you go through your career, you go through incoming, you get promoted, and then all of a sudden you get to a, a big job and you're in pre-peak and you're at your peak. And that might be five years, seven years, 10 years down the line. But what happens over a 30 or 40 year time frame is you'll be going through at least three life cycles like this. So at the end of 10 years, you should be at the peak of your game. And it's at the peak of your game that you have to say, where am I going next? And if you don't put yourself back at the incoming, you will become post-peak. And one of the biggest derailers that I find in individuals is they ride, they ride the curve into post-peak and to outgoing, and the organization goes beyond them. And the organization outgrows them, and they become stuck in their ways, and they become focused on yesterday and on the status quo. And so I tell everybody, where are you on the trend curve? And when you get to the peak, how are you going to reinvent yourself, reinvent you as a person? Take the stretch assignment. If you've been in analytics, go in creative. If you're focused, go do a strategy. If you're on strategy, do something on the operation. But if you don't reinvest yourself and you don't get yourself back onto the trend curve, I guarantee you, you become post-peak. So manage your careers in a way to understand where you are on the trend curve at all times. And if you do that, and if you're self-conscious about that, I think you'll grow and develop much better, and you'll have more rewarding careers as you get deeper into your career. Not your first 10 years, because it's exciting. It's that second decade or that third decade that becomes the most challenging. Because when you get into your 40s, I know it's a long time for a lot of you students, but eventually you'll get into your 40s. You don't want to be perceived as someone who is really good in their 30s and who is someone that was part of yesterday's team. You want the organization to be thinking that you are the hippest, coolest, most innovative, most uh, progressive individual that there is in, in the organization. And that's how you stay fresh. That's how you stay current. That's how you maintain being wanted and value added to an organization. Organizations don't have obligations to keep you, and you don't have obligations to stay with them. If the chemistry works, then, then you'll stay, and the chemistry works. But this is a big reason why the chemistry will work, is that if, if you're focused on your career and you really manage yourself as uh, part of this, uh, this life cycle process. Win collaboratively. One of my favorite movies is called Drumline, with Nick Cannon in it. And, and <laughs> done in uh, 2002, and in, I don't know if any of you have seen it. If you haven't, it's a great flick. And it, it's, uh, it, it's about, a, uh, about all these individuals, especially Nick, who's got this, he's an incredible drummer, and he's this incredible individual, and he's just like off the charts talented. But he was so self-absorbed and self-focused, it was all about him. And the line in the movie that I just love was when the, when the, you know, the conductor in the, he says, we're one band, one sound. And I, and I use that line because I think of Target with 350,000 team members. We're one band, one sound. And that's the way you win. And you have to know the difference between being competitive and being achievement oriented. And being competitive is not a good thing. Being achievement oriented is being a very good thing. And you have to think about the company first, the enterprise first, then your team, and you have to put yourself last. And you really have to figure out how you can win collaboratively. Co collaboratively. This is not, this, life is not a zero-sum game. It is not I win, you lose. We can all win together. And the people that excel at Target Corporation, not only are they super talented, but they get this. And I gotta tell you, we do not want talented superstars that only focus on themselves. Don't apply. Don't apply here. 
There are so many bright individual superstars out there, we don't want you. You can go work for somebody else. We want people that put other people at the center of their universe and put the company and the team first. And if you can develop that inside of you and really understand what that means, that's how you succeed. I think that's how you succeed in life. I think that's how you succeed clearly at Target because we have a very teamy, collaborative culture. And if you are not part of that process, you will not survive our culture. Our culture will boot you out in a hurry. They just, there is, a, uh, is somewhat of a lack of tolerance for, for, for that. Don't compromise your values. I talked about that earlier. I mean, Bill George has written a lot of great books. He's an ex-CEO of Medtronic. Uh, value, uh, the name of the book is True North. And it is all about keeping your moral compass in the right place and never compromising it. Never compromising it for the short term. Um, I would like to think that, that, that all 350,000 team members at, at Target behave in that manner. Uh, they don't, but we really aspire to that type of rich values for, for all of our team members. We look for that uh, intensely when we, when we hire. Um, you know, my dad had a simple saying, and that is around, uh, uh, you know, the keys to success. And it was, it was simply, you know, the, you know, he used to say, the harder you work, it seems like the luckier you get. And there is no sense of entitlement. And, and uh, yeah, you have to be bright. You've got to do all these things. But you've got to work hard, too. And I'm not talking about working 100 hours a week or 80 hours a week. I mean, there are, there are crunch times and there are not crunch times. And you have to figure out how to be efficient, how to work hard, and really demonstrate that uh, you are a highly committed individual to whatever organization you're with. And the harder you work, the luckier you're going to get because people are going to see that. And that, you know, that old cliche, the cream rises to the top, it's true. So you, you work hard and you do those other things. You will rise to the top of an organization. But it is, I will tell you the journey is not linear. You may find the toughest going in the early parts of your career. And there, there, then there might be an accelerated burst where you do two or three levels in a short period of time, and then it might slow down again. So you can't get frustrated early by saying, oh my goodness, I'm moving very slow in this particular, this particular time frame in, in my career. There are pinch points. There are areas that are just very challenging uh, that every organization has. And, and, there, and, you, and when you get through those key areas, then it seems to uh, it flows a little differently. So the cadence is not always the same. But you got to work hard. I mean, it just doesn't come. Every, every great performer and athlete just doesn't show up. It, it, it takes a lot of energy and uh, hard work. You got to take care of yourselves. If you are not fit mentally, uh, physically, um, you know, eventually you will, uh, you, you will not be as happy, you will not be as productive, you will not be as good a performer. You have got to. Uh, make sure that you develop the right kind of uh, health and wellness practices and making sure that you take care of yourself and you exercise and you nurture your body and you nurture your soul to make sure that over time, and you can't say, hey, I don't have time to work out or I don't have the time to, to meet with my small group or this, that, or that. You have to figure out how to do that in, your, in life as priorities. But you've got to take care of yourself. You have to take care of yourself or ultimately... You are not going to. Uh, you're not going to achieve your potential. And lastly, I would say you have to enjoy the journey. I mean, I, I've loved Target for 30 years. I get up every day, and it's exciting for me to come to work. I just love it. Now, not every day of that 30 years has been as enjoyable as other days. But I found something that fit my passion, and it's something that that I knew I wanted to be a retailer. I wasn't sure I was going to be Target, but I knew I wanted to be a retailer. It was just something that I just, I knew it was in the family DNA, and it was something that I knew would play well with, with my skills and my desires and my ambitions. So going to work for me is not going to work. It's going to my other family. It's being with people I love to be with. It's solving complex business problems. It's winning in the marketplace. It's having fun. It's being part of the community. It's being part of an organization and part of a company that I think is unlike any else in America. And when you, when you can find that match, it's a lot of fun. So I would tell you, work to me is a lot of fun. I'm not obsessed where I, it's all I do. I've, you know, I'm married. I've been married for 27 years. My wife's in the back of the, uh, back of the class here. I've got three kids. 
I coached when they were in Little League. I attended you know, many of their events, not all of their events, and I always told uh, when, you know, when they were in those sports kind of ages where it's just busier than, than you can imagine, I always just say I can be the assistant coach, but I can never put the balls in my car. That was, that was the, my rule. I can't put the balls. The soccer balls, the baseballs, the basketballs, they just can't go in my car. So I could be a little late because I might get distracted, but, you, but, but I've always committed to making sure that you, get, you have to enjoy the journey and making sure that uh, part of that journey is making sure you take care of your, you know, your family and, 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 you don't, uh, and, and you don't get uh, too one-sided. And, and I love what I do uh, as a, I love what I do corporately, and I love being a spouse and I love being a dad. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great blend. So anyhow, that is, my, uh, uh, that is the, 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 the the lessons, some of the lessons that I've learned, like I said, these are not all inclusive, and, and there's clearly other great bits of advice that you're going to get from the other leaders that, that come here. And, and I think one of the, the things that you should, one of the things that I've always done is I've, I've been a huge student of behavior. I've spent my whole career watching what people do well, watching what people don't do well, and I make mental notes, and I make concrete notes, and it's, boy, I want to be more like that. Or I, I never want to be like that. I mean, <laughs> the way you just you know, treated somebody in a meeting, I just w I'm never going to do that because that's disrespectful. And so part of it is the amalgamation of what you learn along the way. So as you go through this series of classes and you get the opportunity to talk to other leaders, it's a great time to synthesize all the good ideas that, that you get. And be good observers of behavior and really, really pay attention to those little things in life. And then try and emulate the ones you really like and don't emulate the ones you don't like. So with that, I will, uh, I will stop here and I will, uh, I will open, up the, you know, open it up for uh, Q&A. We've got uh, exactly 20 minutes left. Surely you're not a bashful crowd. Feel free to step down to one of the microphones. Greg, let me ask you a question. I, I heard uh, part of a conversation outside before we started about uh, some of the outreach things that Target does in the, in the local community uh, having to do with cancer. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Cancer patients or Yeah, families? the outreach in, in, in the community. We're focused primarily on education, but we are a corporation with a big heart. As a matter of fact, we just came. Our, uh, our senior leadership team did a volunteer event at St. Jude Children Hospital yesterday in Memphis, which is the world's preeminent Cancer Research Center, and and, uh, and uh, we built two um, long-term stay facilities over the last ten years. It was our tenth year anniversary, so we had a chance to to go and be involved in a in a volunteer event uh, yesterday down in Memphis, and and now we're here today. But uh, we really encourage participation. We we give uh, money to uh, schools in particular, and uh, we don't we don't um, manage what we uh, want our teams to get involved. We just want you to get involved. Just get on the community, whether it's church-related or school-related, just get involved. And, and uh, it's really part of Target's DNA, and our, and our teams are very active in the community. Yes? Um, I was just wondering, you talked a lot about talent development, but what is your best advice for talent retention? Because a lot of different companies that hire for purposes of talent and thought leadership tend to not hire entry-level positions because they are, have a fear of being a stepping stone company versus a destination company. So what's your advice as far as that? Yeah, great concerned? question. It's around uh, the retention of this great talent that we're trying to, to develop and how do you not become an organization because the, that becomes a talent pipeline for everybody else, right? You've got to have the right culture. And, and if you're a meritocracy and you have the right opportunities for, for these individuals that are talented and that are focused on development to grow within your organization. So if you're a growth organization and they perceive that they can continue to grow in the organization and you have competitive wage and benefit packages and you have a, the kind of work-life balance and culture, our good people don't leave. And I, there isn't a person at Target that couldn't leave tomorrow for twice their salary. I guarantee that virtually everybody, our phone rings off the hook. In merchandise, the Gap and Old Navy and Kohl's and Pennies, they want to hire our teams all the time. And so we know that, that we have to treat our people well. The number one reason people leave organizations is because they don't feel valued by their boss or their boss's boss. They don't feel valued, and we, ha we try and make our people feel valued all the time. I, you know, I always use the line, treat your team like you do when you're trying to recruit them. 
And if you treat them as if you're always in a recruitment, you know how everybody goes out of their way and when you're recruiting and we're down here, you see just the best of the target, right? We don't show you all the, all the, you know, the challenges that we have. You, you, we only share with you the best. Well, that's the way you gotta treat your team all the time. We've been very fortunate in that regard. Uh, that we've been able to hang on to our, our best people. And our best people could go a lot of places, but we spend a lot of time together as a team. And you know what? They love what they do, and they like who they work with, and that's how we keep them. Yes? Yes, uh, could you talk about the current economic environment? Are you seeing we're in a post-recession period? Are you seeing shoppers coming back in force? And what do you see for the Christmas season? Yeah, um, I, I, uh, it may be a tad premature to call it a post-recession environment at this point in time. I, I don't think we know that yet. Um, we have approximately 25 million consumers coming through our stores every week, so we're a pretty good proxy on what's happening from a spending standpoint. We are still seeing that people are coming to our stores slightly less often than they have in the past. They're trading down a little bit, so they might, instead of buying a premium product, they might buy the private brand, which frankly we like. Um, and they're also less, they're, they're more disciplined, they're more list focused. So they come in with exactly what they want to get and they're not, they don't allow themselves to get tempted. We're a store that loves to tempt you. So this, does, this, this doesn't work very well for us, this kind of environment. But we've seen stabilization. I would tell you we're, we're fairly optimistic that the worst is behind us. We think that uh, uh, it will be a very slow recovery. Um, you know, job growth is still an issue. Uh, furloughs, wage compression, there are still a lot of issues. And so I, I think some of the economists and, and uh, talking heads have maybe gotten a little ahead of themselves as it relates to where we are and what kind of rebound it's going to be. So we, we, we are in a steady state. We are more optimistic that uh, holiday will be, that there's more upside to holiday than downside. Uh, we had a tough holiday last year, so we're, we're up against easier numbers. But we're, we're taking a fairly cautious approach and when it comes, we'll respond, but we're not, we're not going out and, and anticipating or hiring into believing that there's going to be a change in the economy. So it's pretty steady state, but the best, news, the best news from our perspective, and none of us are economists, is stability. And we're in a very good, stable environment. As long as we can stay there, we think that's really positive. Yes? Thank you. Um, does Target have any plans to uh, move into the international arena? We're, uh, we're a global company from a sourcing standpoint, but we believe we still, we have 1,719 stores today and we believe that we have the potential to add approximately 1,000 more stores domestically in, in the United States. And the, the returns for our shareholders are far greater here domestically than internationally. The chemistry and the DNA of our organization is such that uh, we have to have higher GDP per capita per income because our, our strategy is based on differentiation and not cost. So we, we will only succeed in developed nations where there's a lot of discretionary income. So even though you have an India and a China, China that, is, uh, that are on high growth modes, the GDP per capita income is very low right now and that would be, uh, that would be areas that would not play to our strengths. So as we look at growth beyond 1,000 stores, we think about, is there other opportunities in America? Is there other ways for us to think about target and reaching consumers where we don't have stores by altering what our go-to-market strategy is? So that's one avenue. We've continuously looked at the contiguous uh, geographic areas around the United States, so Canada would be logical. We'll be in Canada at some point in time may not be in the next five years or 10 years, but we think that's a log logical extension, possibly Mexico, uh, unlikely in Europe because it's so developed. So uh, in time, we will become more global with retail stores out the United States, but in the short term, it's not a priority for us. And just a quick follow up on that. Um, when Target gives back to the community, do they, only, do they also give back internationally as well? Do we they do. invest in, in, you know, in, in third world developing countries? We do. We, we, uh, we reinvest, uh, it's a good question, we reinvest uh, our proceeds into all the countries where we have some kind of presence. So we are, have uh, sourcing or even, man, or even uh, quality assurance offices in about 35 countries. And so our, our community uh, uh, programs uh, do go to um, 
the globe. So when there was the, uh, uh, the earthquake in China, when we were having our source, we gave, uh, I think it was a half a million dollars to, the, to the, those families in China, Central America, Eastern Europe, uh, B Bangladesh, all those countries. And, and you can imagine, twenty-five or $50,000 in, uh, in those countries are huge leverage compared to what, they, uh, uh, what that money uh, can buy you here. So uh, we do do that. Yes. Um, I have a Pulse Smart Pen. I know it's featured in the electronics section at Target. And I think it's a really good product, so I was run wondering if uh, it's indicative of future for Target moving into specializing tech products and things like that. You talk about the Pulse Pen? Yeah. We want to be a, we, we want to be a, uh, our, our, our merchandising strategy is to really be a leader in, and, uh, in, at the right place on that trend curve, right? So, yet we have to understand our limitations. So there are certain things that we want to be fashion forward and we want to be right where, where the fashion epicenter is in apparel and in home. And in electronics, the same thing goes. We want to be, we want to be there with the hippest and the coolest products, but we are a self-service environment in a large format without service. So unless it's understandable, or unless you can research it online and really know what you want, we can't carry everything that we would like to in electronics. So we don't carry computers because the life cycle is so short and they're very complex and they're high return rates. So we really look at it category by category to try and figure out where to play and how to win. So that, those are the, you know, the two merchandising core tenants is should we be in this business? Yes or no? You know, where do we play and how do we, we win? And we've got to <laughs> optimize the assortment within our 130,000 square foot store and, and make choices. Yes. Hi. Um, I know you said that Target kind of changed its brand image in the last 15 years. When you make such a big change like that, how do you convey that all the way from your headquarters down to your stores, down to your consumer? Great question. <clears throat> Changing who you are and aspiring to be something else is incredibly complex. It takes a tremendous amount of commitment and time and energy and resources to do that. Because you can imagine you've got an organization that want, that's used to doing it one way, and now you're trying to move the organization another way. And there are a lot of people that, that didn't agree with that strategy. And so over time, people that didn't agree maybe had to leave the organization. But it's really, it's a, it's a foundational building block. We had to go out there and we had to say, this is what our strategy is going to be. And we had to stick to it. We had to define the guardrails. And when, when we were in tough times, there were, there, were a lot, there were a lot of subsequent years where people said, boy, you know, business is pretty tough. Are you sure this is the right strategy? We just were very focused and said, we have to be committed to this strategy. And over time, we just kept going after it and after it and after it. When we first started that, we wanted to develop celebrity partners and we wanted to have you know, that cachet and that target. Nobody from Hollywood would, would even return a phone call. I mean, for us to do an exclusive deal with Prince Today or Black Eyed Peas, I mean, they call us all the time. Back 15, 20 years ago, they wouldn't return our calls. There wasn't a designer that wanted to talk to us. Michael Graves was the first one, and it was kind of a breakthrough moment. And then once we, we got that, and we developed that item and the potential, and the organization saw that, wow, and, and it started that snowball. So it was, it's been a very long uh, process to get the whole organization there. I know that Target's been doing a lot as far as um, really minimizing packaging and making their stores a lot more efficient, energy efficient to run. But uh, what are you looking to do to move forward in the world of sustainability? Yep, sustainability obviously on everybody's mind, and, and whether it's uh, whether it's uh, our vendor terms of it starts with who we do business with and what our expectations of uh, of them are, both domestically and internationally. So we have to have the right um, the right values in terms of who we're going to do business with and, and the values surrounding those relationships. Uh, you know, we try and build our buildings that are LEED certified wherever we possibly can, solar panels, uh, energy efficiency, uh, coolers and uh, refrigeration that have LED lighting and motion sensors and so all of those kinds of things that make sense and, and have a where there's commercially viable options at reasonable cost, we try and do that. As you cited, packaging, is a, it's a huge issue. Uh, hazardous uh, products in our stores, trying to get uh, manufacturers to move uh, even their processes and the products that, that they sell uh, into, in, into better, safer kinds of products. So it's a, it's a tremendous movement across the organization that we've been on. We've been on this journey for many, many years. Clearly, we've accelerated it in the last, but we were one of the first retailers to put a garment on hanger 
which we recycled all of our hangers and apparel. We started that in 1994. And we were one of very early adopters to do that. We've been recycling plastic and cardboard in our stores for a very long time. So where there's a good idea, we want to we embrace that and take advantage of it. Hi, good morning. Thanks for stopping by campus. Uh, one of your leadership lessons is appreciate the tough times. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been able to appreciate during these last couple of years? Yeah, I was named CEO on May 1st of 2008. So you talk about a freshman year uh, uh, experience. Uh, and I took over from a, from a gentleman that had been our CEO for 13 years and had been an, an icon. So I came in just as the economy was, was uh, uh, Im imploding and, and going south. Uh, we've had to downsize our organization, went through a proxy contest, and we've had the, the lowest same-store sales uh, in, 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 our, in our company's histories, and we, and we also have a financial services arm that has underperformed as well. So uh, it, it, really, it really, you know, it, 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 first of all, it teaches you, you've got to get together with your team. You've got to make sure that, first and foremost, uh, in, in my first year, I spent time making sure that, that, that we all could work together, and we all shared the same vision, mission, values, and we're going to proceed uh, together as an organization, that we're going to uh, make the tough calls, but we're not going to overreact. And we're going to spend a lot of time being honest, and we're going to over-communicate with our teams. And I'm going to be really honest, and, and, and I'm going to be vulnerable, and I'm going to tell them exactly what we see, where we are stable and where we are not. Our balance sheet was strong. I, we could talk about that, but our sales... We're not, and so, uh, so what, the lesson that, that, that I learned is, as long as you're genuine and authentic and you're honest, the team wants, just, they just want an honest assessment. Where are we, Greg? Just, just, just give, us the, give us the truth. And, uh, and I thought that was one of, the, uh, one of the lessons that we took to heart early as an organization, was getting our teams together, having more chat sessions, having more town hall meetings, opening up to forums like this where they could ask any question on what was going on in the organization so that we just became far more transparent. So our stores knew where they stood, our DC teams knew where they stood, our global sourcing, because they all wanted to know, are we okay? Are we okay? So we really, we spent a lot of time um, developing new ways to communicate with our teams a lot more frequently, and, and that, I think that really served us well during this, this uh, last 12 months. Yes? From a career standpoint, if you could go back to being like our age, is there anything you would have done differently or any recommendations that you'd make to us that you didn't do when you were our age? Well, I, you know, I put a lot of lessons up there. I think I would have, uh, I think I, I would have pushed myself to develop in other disciplines quicker. I was, I was more focused on the classic business undergrad and graduate. I wish I would have had... Uh, if I could script it over, I'd keep all of that, and I would love to have a philosophy degree and an English major, too. Uh, there's, there is, there's so much out there that I didn't really know, and I didn't have the right kind of... I was first generation to go to college, so there was, no, there was no help along the way. Today, there's tremendous resources for all of you, and, and so I think that if you can... Make sure that while you appreciate the discipline you are in, there are some other great areas that I think that if you spend a little bit of time, more time exploring at an earlier age, you'll, you'll develop that broader scope earlier than I was able to, to do. So that's what I would encourage you to is, is to push yourself out of those boundaries uh, quicker than you might otherwise. I have time for, I think, one more question. 11.58. Going once, oh. going twice. Thank you, everybody. You've been a terrific audience. Thank you, Greg, Greg, I can only say in my former life, we used to talk about leaders who believed so strongly in what they were doing that they had the capability to probably make a rock jump up and run across the street. Clearly, that's the mold that you're in. I, I heard you outside. You didn't all have this opportunity, but to hear him outside talking with his own family members, but his target family members as well, it's so obvious 
that Mr. Steinhoffel is someone who is committed to what he's doing and really believes in it. Thank you for coming here oh, you're welcome. and joining us. Thank you very this much. Is a, and because he's in Minneapolis, St. Paul, we figured that a good Notre Dame fleece would be a nice warm thing to take along. Fleece, long underwear, hats, the whole thing. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much.